Okay, I think it's time. Uh, uh, welcome to Said Business School, uh, University of Oxford. We're thrilled to have a full house here. And uh, more than anything, we're thrilled to welcome uh, Tim O'Reilly uh, and his new book. And uh, we're thrilled to hear his, his presentation. I had a chance to visit with uh, Tim for a few minutes uh, over tea. And uh, he's a very Oxford guy, I discovered, so on a number of dimensions. One of them is that throughout our conversation, we talked about perception. He quoted Wallace Stevens, who I didn't tell him, he's one of my favorite poets. And so we talked about Wallace Stevens. And we talked about AI, and we talked about many things. And uh, Oxford is a very interdisciplinary place, and, uh, and so it's a Tim O'Reilly kind of place, and so we're thrilled to have him here. And he also wrestles with uh, not small problems, but big problems and big questions, which is what we at Said Business School try to do, is we're interested in world scale problems and questions, and how do we tackle them and in an interdisciplinary way. And, and so I would uh, um, highly recommend his book, uh, What's the Future and Why It's Up to Us. Now, as an academic, it makes me cringe to recommend sort of any books. We're, we're inherently sort of a skeptical bunch, and so I rarely recommend books. But this one is a whirlwind tour into all kinds of interesting issues, and it has interesting references to sort of the latest research it related to markets and the theory of the firm. And I was just looking, it's got sort of references to uh, Blake and T.S. Eliot and so forth, which makes it just fantastic reading. And so I'd highly, highly uh, recommend it. Beyond that, uh, if you go on Wikipedia, there's a very long entry for Tim O'Reilly, so you can read about his, his background. He's been sort of at the forefront of predicting the future for, for many, many years in, in Silicon Valley. In, and, and, uh, and so I would highly recommend that to him. But uh, please join me in uh, welcoming uh, Tim O'Reilly. I, I should probably, before I start in the talk, I should say thank you very much. And uh, I should warn you that I've got a bit of a cold. Uh, and the only consolation is that, as Oscar Wilde said, only the mediocre man is always at his best. Um, so clicker. So <clears throat> when I left for this speaking trip, I spoke to a $100 device in my kitchen, asked it if my flight was on time, and then told it to call me a car. And a few minutes later, a car showed up to take me to the airport. You know, somebody just a few years ago, seeing that, would have said, WTF? And it would have been this expression of amazement. Uh, but a lot of people are hearing the news from the frontiers of technology, and they're saying WTF. Uh, in a very different tone of voice. You know, they've actually, hmm, it's not advancing. Well, that's because I'm holding it upside down. <laughs> WTF. Uh, they're hearing uh, this study from uh, your colleagues here at Oxford that 47% of jobs are at risk of being automated in the next 20 years. They hear a lot of people in Silicon Valley talking about universal basic income. Now, you know, here's actually a little Elliot for you that's not in the book. Uh, Universal basic income may be a great idea, but Elliot reminded us this last temptation is the greatest treason to do the right deed for the wrong reason. You know, the reason should not be that there's no work left for humans to do. So we've been there before. You know, you guys all know the history of the Luddite Rebellion and people, you know, smashing the machine looms. It was actually not because they were, quote, Luddites. They were like, hey, dudes, let us have a seat at the table to figure out how to, you know, make this stuff work for us as well as for you. Uh, but neither the weavers nor the mill owners could imagine the bounty that came from the Industrial Revolution. They couldn't imagine that ordinary people, not just kings and queens, would have fruit in the middle of winter, that you know, ordinary people would have you know, endless changes of clothes, the disposability of clothing today. You know, and they couldn't imagine that, that we would build skyscrapers a mile high, that we dig a tunnel to France. Uh, they couldn't imagine we'd split the atom, that we'd put satellites in space, that we'd fly through the air, all these amazing things. And they couldn't imagine that their great-grandchildren and on, onward would live so much longer. This chart, uh, which also comes here from Oxford, from uh, Max Rose's Our World in Data, you know, kind of shows as countries industrialize, lifespans increase. You know, for hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, occasionally lifespans got shorter. They never really got longer. And then suddenly, magically, around the middle of the 1800s, they start to climb. And every time a country 
joins the Industrial Revolution, they climb again. So clearly they couldn't imagine that. And they couldn't imagine that their descendants would find so much fulfilling work, despite the fact that the machines were doing things that they used to do. Right? So what is our failure of imagination? You know, what is our failure of imagination that all we can see is a jobless future? And that's really the question that I really try to take up in this book. What is our failure of imagination? Why are we choosing not to build that future where that productivity cycle continues? Because actually, here is what experience tells us happens when companies do the right thing. Uh, from 2014 to 2016, Amazon added 45,000 robots to their warehouses. And they added 250,000 human workers. And since then, uh, that progress has continued. And the reason is because they did not say, we're going to do the same thing with fewer people. They said, we're going to do more. You know, you know when I talked to, to people in Amazon Logistics, they said, yeah, the robots let us pack more products into the warehouses. They let us get to them faster. Uh, and so as a result, they were able to put more products on next day delivery or even in some zip codes to go to same day delivery. So they upped the ante. They did more with technology, which is, of course, exactly what happened back in the Industrial Revolution. And Jeff Bezos calls this the flywheel, you know, where uh, you know, better customer experience leads to more traffic. It brings in more sellers onto the platform. There's, there's more selection. You know, it's this virtuous circle. Uh, and of course, this is, is that wonderful thing that we can get going when we use technology correctly to do things to make the world uh, stronger, better, faster. And again, you know, I'm not saying that the consumer society that we built is actually necessarily the best society. There's a, there's a bunch in the book about uh, Keynes and, and this idea of at what point does the ability of machines to do more of the work actually let us step off the wheel. And I, I, I don't get to that in this talk. But uh, it's still this fundamental idea that the master design technology pattern of technology is not to do less you know, to, to get rid of people, it's actually to do more, to do things that were previously unimaginable. So part of our failure of imagination, though, shows up in this really distressing number, and uh, this distressing graph, which is, and this is from America, I'm sure there's a very similar graph for you here in the UK, and that's that productivity has continued to increase, and yet household incomes have stagnated. And there's a bunch of economists uh, and financial writers who've talked about this. If you haven't read Capital in the 21st Century, you probably don't belong here, mm -hmm. or at least looked about or read you know, other great books like Why Nations Fail, you know, about why extractive economies are, are less robust than inclusive economies. Uh, uh, Mariana Mazzucato's Entrepreneurial State, about the role of, of uh, collective action and state uh, invention in, in the technology industry. Uh, there's all these amazing books. Uh, about this subject. But I, I thought I needed to write the story from a technology point of view. You know, how is work changing? You know, what does technology make possible today that we couldn't do before? What work needs doing? And how do we make the world you know, more prosperous for everyone? And above all, why aren't we doing it? I try to debug, in some sense, uh, the world economy through the lens of what we've learned from tech. So, so this is the lens I take. You know, I've, I've interacted with many of the great technology platforms over uh, you know, three decades. And I basically share in the form of a memoir, uh, which wraps a business book, which wraps this economic call to action, uh, this story of what I've learned from the great technology platforms, ranging from Microsoft through Google, Apple, uh, Airbnb, Uber, uh, uh, Amazon. And, you know, I draw different lessons from each one, Facebook. And, uh, and so I want to share with you some of those lessons. And the first one is that platforms are economies. And, and I've been actually, uh, was just up at INET, the Institute for New Economic Thinking Conference, and <laughs> urging them to spend more time studying technology platforms because they're actually natural <laughs> laboratories for economic research. And of course, the companies know this. They all now have chief economists. But the economists from outside need to study those platforms and generalize from them. So, but economies are also ecologies. And so I've actually taken an idea uh, in the book from evolutionary biology of fitness landscapes, 
which is this idea that uh, you know organisms have a, you know, sort of a, a genetic fitness, uh, uh, and, and you can actually represent this graphically, and that uh, when uh, you know you have a, 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 a sort of a mature ecosystem, everything is at, at a local maximum, and when conditions change, though, there needs to be a migration uh, to, new to, to new areas. We're actually seeing this today as a result of climate change, where things that have been stable start to change. Species have to adapt. Some of them you know, fail. Some of them uh, move on uh, um, successfully. And that same thing happened in technology. You know, it also has a fitness landscape. We see that you know, Microsoft came to be the apex predator, so to speak, of the, of the ecology of the PC, and they basically had developed a set of skills and competencies and, and, and a business model that let them stay on top. And what happened? There's this really interesting lesson. You know, it's much easier to get to the next peak of a fitness landscape, the next local maximum, from the bottom than it is from the top. You know, so that's one of the reasons why I believe that you often find new technologies starting on the margins. So in, in the case of my experience, you know, I saw it happening with open source software and the, and the web, and of course that led to this new peak, which is now dominated by Google. Uh, there was actually a kind of interesting story about the smartphone, uh, which is that Apple you know, kind of defined this new fitness peak. Uh, but then uh, Google actually figured out how to actually enable this ecosystem of, of um, uh, of experimentation and generosity by actually open sourcing Android, which kind of gave them a transition into that smartphone market. So this is this idea that generosity is actually what's down there at the bottom, you know, and so it's sort of this idea of, of inclusive, uh, open economies, which eventually lead up to these extractive economies as companies sort of master each new peak of the technology fitness landscape. So, you know, many of you know the fundamental uh, you know, von Neumann architecture of modern computing was put into the public domain. It was paid for by the U.S. government as part of the atomic bomb project. Uh, so it came out of the Institute for Advanced Studies. IBM built the first generation of computer monopoly. So once again, openness led to monopoly. And then IBM gave away the architecture of the PC. They didn't think it was that important to market. They published the specs, said anybody could make it. So this explosion, which came to be dominated by Microsoft, Tim Berners-Lee put the web into the public domain. So each time, this explosion of generosity, which uh, led to uh, this new wave of innovation, which was eventually captured uh, by, uh, you know, in some ways, extractive companies. And of course, government plays a big role in this. Uh, one of the things that's really fascinating in Mariana's book, she ex explains how all of the technology in the iPhone, this is just a few. I mean, even things like Gorilla Glass were funded by the government. You know, people forget that Google was actually out of the National Science Foundation Digital Libraries Project that initially funded it. You know, there's so much of uh, the technology that we, can't, that we take for granted and we think of as coming from, um, you know, from entrepreneurs and venture capitalists. This is, a, this is fake news, basically. The, tru the truth is so much innovation comes from, you know, explorers who are having fun and from, you know, government and university funded research. So I've all tried to put this in practice in my own company. You know, at O'Reilly Media, uh, you know, we actually have a, 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 a <coughs> slogan, uh, you know, or a motto or a, a goal, which is to create more value than we capture. And this came about actually because uh, back in the early days of the internet, uh, more than one dot com billionaire said, you know, I built my company uh, with one of your books. And I went, wow, we got 35 bucks, you got a billion dollars, cool. <laughs> you know, it was, and, and I actually was telling this story and my VP of marketing said, well, that should be our slogan, we create more value than we capture. But it really has become a business practice for us. When we launched in 2000 our Safari online books platform, which has now morphed into an online learning platform, we invited our biggest competitor into the platform, you know, because we said, oh, we really believe in this, you know, platform economy. And in fact, as we've added new features like live online training, what we've gone out to our partners and we've said, we need you to onboard with this. You know, we don't want to take too much of the revenue from the platform. We want it to work for you as well as us. And that's super important business principle, I think, for making a long-lasting company and a long-lasting society. 
So um, talking with Satya Nadella recently, and he made that same point. He said, you know, and he makes this point in his, his new book, Hit Refresh, you know, that Microsoft was originally a company that was devoted to kind of creating opportunity for developers, creating opportunity, and they forgot that. And he's trying to bring people back to that original vision. And I think he's done a good job. So the second lesson uh, uh, of the book, uh, you know, is that our maps of the world can steer us wrong. So, you know, in 1625, there was this famous map of the Americas, which showed California as an island. And this map persisted for 100 years, and people acted on it. Well, we have similar maps, and in my own history, you know, uh, a big one I was involved with was the story about open source software. You know, when we were originally talking about Linux and free software, everybody was focused on the idea that it was an alternative to Microsoft Windows. And I put out a very different narrative, which was that open source software was somewhere else. So let me ask you a question. How many of you in the room use Linux? Okay, how many of you use Google? Okay, you all use Linux. But you know, you have this, this frame, even now, you know, <coughs> and now 20 years later, that what you use is what's in front of you. And in fact, nowadays, I started to recognize much before a lot of other people did <laughs> that you know, the internet was built with open source software and it was becoming a platform uh, in which websites were applications. And the applica there was also a bunch of other things, that the applications were always updated. You know, uh, you know uh, Microsoft Word was a software artifact. Somebody made it, it was like a machine. But Google was a business process and the programmers were still inside it. You know, Apple, I mean, not, you know, Apple actually is sort of a hybrid, but Amazon, you know, they have new content coming in every day. My book came out. They had to add it to the service. Uh, people are adding comments from outside humans and machines and all this working together. And this has started to be uh, clearer and clearer as the model. And I, I, I recognized very, uh, that out of that, that big data and collective intelligence of, of users contributing data was going to become a new source of competitive advantage. So, um, and, and that was sort of the essence of what I defined as Web 2.0, which was, you know, harnessing collective intelligence. And, you know, that was the thing that distinguished all the companies that survived the dot-com bust. So, why am I telling you this ancient history? Because we're still doing it. We still have this kind of framing blindness all the time. You know, if you were in New York, I don't know if you have this in, here in the UK, but in New York in 2005, this is what the connected taxi cab looked like. Let's put a screen in the back and we can show ads. It's like, they, again, once again, the old metaphor dominated and they showed the world, they you know, replayed, entrepreneurs replayed the world the way it was. And you know, we now know that that's not correct. So you have to actually, as you, if you're an entrepreneur, don't just recreate what went before, rethink business models, rethink workflows and processes in terms of what technology now makes possible. So there's this great um, tweet from um, Aaron Levy, and he said, you know, this is, shows you how old it was because Uber was only worth $3.5 billion at the time. You know, Uber's a $3.5 billion lesson in building for how the world should work rather than optimizing for the way the world does work. You know, uh, all of the previous attempts to build, you know, online taxi services were little tweaks to the existing model. And so here's the thing that's really interesting and I think it, uh, is, is sort of a key idea, which is that a business model is the way that all the parts of a business work together to create competitive advantage and customer value. And so when you look at Uber, you know, there's a lot of companies who think, well, we'll just make an app, right? If we have an app, we'll be just like Uber, you know, taxi companies. But it doesn't work that way because it's the entire system. The thing that uh, companies hate about Uber is that there's all these unlicensed drivers who just show up, right? And, and, and that's actually why Uber can say, we're going to get you a driver in three to five minutes, even if you're not in the, you know, the center city, uh, you're somewhere out in the suburbs, because they built this marketplace model that brings in more supply to meet demand. And they use algorithms to try to match that, and they use incentives. And so they've really come up with a very, very different business model. So they've also spent a lot of money trying to convince people that, you know, and they've spent money subsidizing rides because they want to try to convince people to give up their cars and accept a new way of, of doing things. So, you know, the app is only, you know, a little bit of it. You know, so, and that's why simply, you know, adding an app doesn't change the game for taxis because 
uh, you know, you actually have to have all the parts of the business model. And so the key, this kind of led me back in that direction of what makes a platform work. And uh, it was actually the chief economist at Uber who said his Bible was this book called Who Gets What and Why. Uh, it's by Alvin uh, E. Roth, who got a Nobel Prize for redesigning the marketplace for, for kidneys. Uh, you know, basically realizing that uh, if you could actually redesign the matching algorithm that's used to, to you know, match up kidney donors with uh, kidney recipients, you can actually uh, improve the, uh, uh, you know, the outcomes and get a lot more people matched. And, and it was interesting because um, and Jonathan Hall, the economist at Uber, said, this is my Bible because this is the heart of our business, is actually how do we get better at matching? And you think about that, uh, uh, you know, the, the, this design of marketplaces central to the success of Google's ad auction, uh, you know, at least according to, to uh, Jonathan, central to what Uber is trying to do. So if, if you understand that platforms are marketplaces and you understand uh, that the matching marketplace has to work for all its participants, not just for users and the marketplace owner and there's various kinds of market failure, you actually have to design that market. And, and of course Uber, despite Jonathan's best efforts, has failed to do that because they basically didn't treat their drivers very well and as a result uh, they, they created uh, bad, bad will with uh, the public and Lyft has been gaining market share in the U.S. and they've been beaten around the world. So uh, it, it really has consequences. So the, the, the next lesson that I take from technology is that as it changes, people learn new skills and they create new kinds of jobs. And there's a wonderful book on this subject that I highly recommend called Learning by Doing uh, by an economist, uh, an actually former technologist uh, at UMass, uh, I believe he's at, uh, at UMass, um, and uh, named James Besson. And he talks about the mills in Lowell, Massachusetts in 1840. And he has this really interesting, a uh, well, whole bunch of interesting points. One is that, uh, you know, there's this sort of storyline that the unskilled factory workers replaced the highly skilled weavers. And he did a bunch of analysis of the wages of, and the earnings of, of the, uh, you know, hand weavers and the factory workers. And he found in each case it took uh, a worker a year to come up to speed. So based on the cost of training them, they were actually equally skilled, they were just differently skilled. So um, a really interesting thing. But he, he made a really interesting argument that it's not just technology innovation, but how the diffusion of technology through society uh, that makes the, the difference in making us all richer. And he kind of gives this uh, example of, of um, you know, milling, and actually this graph is actually out of Wikipedia of what a modern milling factory looks like and all the different machines that kind of work together in a workflow. You know, and he kind of outlines how this took 30, 40, 50 years to figure that out. And he said, you know, there were new machines, people had to learn the skills to operate them, to fix them, to improve them. And, you know, this is the secret to why it's so hard to make another Silicon Valley, you know, or another Shenzhen. Because you have all the people, you have the ecosystem of the people with the knowledge to fix, to improve. Uh, you know, people can hire new people. Uh, there's this innovation, you know, again, that flywheel that Jeff Bezos talked about. And an educated, prepared workforce. And he kind of walks through that. And the same thing, anyway, this, this story has particular resonance for me because my mom grew up back of the mill uh, in Bradford. Uh, Lister's Mill was at one point the largest silk mill in the world. And there I am at, at uh, age 16 on the site of my old family house, uh, which you can see right behind the mill. And uh, of course, this mill at one point, uh, you know, had 11,000 workers. And then uh, I think about the time that I was uh, there, when I, you know, 45 years ago, it was down to about 15 workers running automated machinery. And um, you know, that was that great arc of technology. Um, but, you know, the, the, the thing that's sort of so interesting <laughs> is that what did we do to actually deal with that transition in the first industrial revolution? I can't resist showing you this other old family photo, this one from Ireland. Uh, it's a bunch of shoeless kids outside the little school in Lissabagin, uh, uh, which is just outside Killarney in Ireland. Uh, the kid on the end with the shoes is my dad. This is about 1928. Uh, the old man with the, the beard is my great-grandfather. My grandfather was actually inside teaching class. And, uh, you know, when my dad died, it was really, uh, you know, something we, we buried him in Ireland. And he was carried to his grave by some of those classmates, some of the shoeless kids. And they were still farmers. 
But you know, he went on to become an eminent neurologist, the head of neurology at George Washington University, a researcher on Parkinson's disease and Wilson's disease. He was a pioneer in nuclear medicine, a pioneer in, in uh, you know, early genetics, uh, genetic diseases. And you know, that was education. You know, and, and that investment in education, you know, back to the beginning of uh, you know, that industrial revolution, we stopped sending kids into factories, we stopped sending them to the farms, we sent them to school, then we had a high school movement, and we had higher education. So critical, that investment in society. Uh, Bob Putnam, uh, the, the famous sociologist, uh, said in a meeting I was in, this beautiful statement, he said, all of the advances in society have come when we have invested in other people's children. You know, which is why it's so criminal that we don't continue uh, to see investment in education as a critical thing. So we like to think that technology moves more quickly today, you know, and that's the reason why we're having all these problems. But I don't buy that. Actually, the, the history of, you know, if you look at the history of weaving and uh, spinning machines, you know, 60, 70 years for them to be perfected. But we're really, we're ready, you know, almost, you know, what is it, TCPIP was, what, 73? You know, so, my gosh, you know, we're already 35 years into the internet era. You know, we're, we're uh, 20 plus years into the web, you know, more than that, into the web. Uh, you know, 30, actually, it just really gets long, right? And, and I think by the time we get to the stage of, you know, Lister's Mill at full performance, we'll be 50 years on. You know, so it's still evolving. So, but here's the thing, as technology evolves, we really are gonna have to focus on learning. There's this great quote that I use in my book from the guy who runs the Fulbright Scholarship Board now. He said, if the students we're training today are gonna to live to be 120 years old and their careers are likely to span 90 years, but their training will only make them competitive for 10, then we have a problem. You know, and that's why I think you know, at O'Reilly, we really see you know, our learning platform as the key to what we do. We're trying to build a platform for continuing education. And I know those of you who are in education here at Oxford, that's what you're doing also. But we really have to understand what does it mean for education to be continuous? What does it mean to make affordances for people who are working to continue to learn? You know, there's a special privilege when you're part of a university where that's your job. You get to do that. But we kind of eke it out in, in businesses. And, you know, I, I think there's this really interesting debate, and I talk about this in the book, uh, and this was a debate about stock buybacks. Uh, and it was, uh, um, Warren Buffett, in his letter to shareholders earlier this year, you know, complained about stock buybacks, but said, well, companies are doing them instead of more productive investment because there's nothing, you know, no good place for them to use their money. But Larry Fink, who's the CEO of BlackRock, also wrote a letter to his investors about the same time. And it's almost like an answer to Warren Buffett. And he said, come on. There's something you invest in, invest in your people. Invest in training them in order to fully reap the benefits of a changing economy and sustain growth over the long term. Businesses need to increase the earnings potential of the workers. You know, and there's this cycle of our society that we have to invest in. So, next lesson that I've taken from technology platforms. Change happens gradually and then suddenly. It's this wonderful phrase from Ernest Hemingway who used it to describe bankruptcy. A character was asked, you know, how did you go bankrupt? He said, oh, two ways, gradually, then suddenly. Of course, if you're a technical person, you know that happens with technical debt too. You know, it suddenly catches up to you, you know, kind of adds up and then you're screwed. Um, but, um, you know, that's also the way technologies sort of accumulate, you know, and suddenly the world seems very, very different. You know, there's this combinatorial innovation that happens. You know, we got the internet, we got the World Wide Web, and then we got the mobile phone, and all of a sudden, all kinds of new things became possible. And uh, we're, we're really at this combinatorial moment. You know, AI is now coming into the mix. Uh, you know, all the services that we took as digital services are now interpenetrating the real world. So this is what I see happening gradually, then suddenly, that AI and algorithmic systems are everywhere, and new kinds of partnership with humans. You know, and, and this is the thing. We talk a lot about robots and self-driving cars. We have to understand that they are not autonomous. They are part of this network. They're part of a network that includes people. 
There's a data center, the people operating the data center. You know, a system like Uber is so interesting to me because it's sort of a model of the future. It's people managed by algorithms, which are in turn managed by other people. Uh, there's devices that are actually effectively cognitive augmentation for the workers. Uh, and and self-driving cars may well be part of that mix. But it's a system that involves both machines and people in this complex dance. And of course, this idea of cognitive augmentation, we're so hung up on augmented reality being, you know, I'm, I'm looking through some glasses. I mean, you know, Google Maps is augmented reality. And this idea that somebody can actually find their way around the city, that they can find some person on a street corner, you know, because their <laughs> phones are communicating where they each are in real time, that's a superpower that we did not used to have. What else could we use it for? You know, I mean, and we have all these you know, crazy, wasteful <laughs> ideas floating around Silicon Valley, like we'll be the Uber of dry cleaning, we'll be the Uber of, uh, you know, of food delivery for, for yuppies. And I go, no, actually, you know, there's a really great one that I love to talk about, and that's Zipline, which is, we'll be the Uber of blood delivery in Rwanda using drones. We can get, you know, people are dying because they can't get to the hospital, and we can get them blood in 25 minutes anywhere in the country. You know, that's pretty awesome use of on-demand and, you know, all this uh, idea of, wow, we can match up people in real time. You know, and I, you know, given that that's your focus, you know, think about all the things that we could do with on-demand technology and these new partnerships. We could restructure healthcare. We could restructure education. Uh, you know, we could restructure a lot of positive things in our society. So this idea of humans and machines coming together actually really can take us a long way. And I've been fascinated by this uh, idea of symbiogenesis, which was a term that was put out originally by some Russian scientists around 1915 or so. But Lynn Margulis picked it up around 1967. And it was this idea that multicellular organisms are actually, uh, a col they're colony organisms, that the uh, the mitochondria in uh, the cells of animals or chloroplasts in the cells of plants are actually bacteria that live inside those plants. And this was not proven until we got genetic analysis, which allowed us to see that they actually do have, in fact, have distinct DNA from the cell nucleus. And so think about that and imagine technological symbiogenesis, right? There is a, a um, you know, a um, mitochondrion inside of, uh, you know, the Google nucleus, you know? <laughs> and the reason I mention this is this idea that has really obsessed me for pretty much the last 20 years, which is that we are building a global brain, that technology is connecting all of us in a new way. You know, every time we click on a Google link, we're teaching Google something. <laughs> every time, you know, we click on Facebook, and Facebook is a great example because you can actually see it in real time. You know, if you click on you know, fake news, you'll get more fake news. If you click on your friend's updates showing you their, their kid or their vacation, you'll get more of that. You know, it's literally this real-time feedback loop. You know, again, think about that Google, I mean, that, that Uber driver. They're in some kind of symbiogenesis as this kind of organism. So I start to think about AI, and I go, maybe we're thinking about AI wrong. Maybe we're thinking that it's this thing that we'll create that'll be like us. But maybe we'll be inside of it. Maybe we are, you know, in some sense, the microbiome. You know, this is a different, I'm mixing my biological metaphors here. Uh, but maybe we're the microbiome of the AI. And when you start thinking about this, it just opens your mind to thinking in a fresh way. Anyway, I want to move on to the more pragmatic uh, from, from that, you know, kind of mind stretching stuff. Hal Varian, at Google's chief economist, once said to me, my grandfather wouldn't recognize what I do as work. And, uh, you know, I mean, he clearly got that wrong. I mean, really? I mean, there's programmers at Pivotal, there's some people in a Victorian sweatshop. But realistically, if you actually think about it correctly, the workers at Google or Facebook and companies like that are programs and algorithmic systems and data models. And the programmers are their managers. We all just got basically promoted, you know, to managing these new tools. And uh, so there's this really interesting, you know, some of these jobs that we think about can only be done by these machines we built. You know, and it's interesting, fake news is a great example at Facebook. Um, 
you know, a lot of people were saying, well, you know, we need to hire more humans, you know, to, to check the fake news. But they can't do it unaided. Yes, maybe they should have more, you know, human fact checkers. But come on, there's seven billion pieces of content posted on Facebook a day. You know, kind of saying that humans should somehow check it all, you know, as opposed to, well, this is an algorithmic problem. And there's so much criticism. Facebook says, well, it's an algorithmic problem. It goes, oh man, they're engineers, and because they're engineers, they can't understand the human element. I go, no, it's just a really big, hard problem. You know, and yes, you have to actually put the humans in it, but augmented humans, in the same way that we wouldn't try to build that building in the slide without that crane, we're not going to build, uh, you know, a better algorithmic management system for Facebook uh, to, you know, control fake news uh, without a marriage of humans and machines. You know, humans are actually the managers of the machines that are going to actually do the work. So, Here's the thing I've been also then thinking about. All these algorithmic systems have an objective function, the thing that they're optimizing for. You know, so Uber and Lyft is pickup time. They want to get you there and get you picked up, matched up in, in three to five minutes. Google is trying to match for relevance. You get the result that you want, you click on an ad and you go away and you're happy. Right? Facebook has actually, despite the fact that they're both advertising business models, Facebook says, we want you to come, we want you to stay, we want you to spend more time. You know, the scheduling systems used by big companies like Walmart or The Gap or McDonald's or, uh, you know, whatever your, you know, equivalent companies are uh, here in the UK, you know, they actually have, as their objective function, reduce employee labor costs and benefits. And I, uh, so I have to say, for all the, the hating that gets done on Uber and Lyft, I go, they actually have a, um, you know, a pro-social objective function, which means that as they improve it, there's at least a reasonable chance, particularly given the marketplace dynamics that, that at least I understand, uh, you know, are driving them, they're actually going to end up having to make it be work for their drivers or they won't actually succeed. Whereas these models uh, at, uh, you know, more traditional companies are pretty, pretty, you know, worker hostile. So I actually think we need to fix those too. But here's the thing about objective functions. They're a lot like the genies of Arabian mythology. And if you've ever heard the stories of, you know, uh, you know, Aladdin and the magic lamp, you know, you get three wishes, you know, and actually, you know, you, you, you kind of have to basically pick your wish and frame it very carefully. And in the fairy tales, the people always get the wish wrong, right? You know, they say it in some way that didn't quite work and they get unintended consequences. So we actually have that, right? Facebook didn't mean to create fake news. They didn't mean, you know, to amplify hyperpartisanship. They thought their algorithms were going to amplify social connections and make this great advertising business. But we expect them to fix what they're doing. So this kind of leads me to this, you know, question about AI again. You know, uh, Elon Musk says AI is the most serious threat to the survival of the human race. And, uh, you know, he's actually described it in terms of the runaway objective function. So did Nick Bostrom. You know, Nick Bostrom was originally, he, uh, in, in his book, Superintelligence, he talked about the paperclip maximizer. You know, Elon uh, used in a recent Vanity Fair interview, he used the image of a strawberry picking machine. You know, he's, you know it's effectively, it's self-improving and it's been given the objective function of pick strawberries and pick, you know, and it wants to get better and better at picking strawberries and eventually it realizes that humans are in the way of strawberry fields forever because we phrased the wish wrong. That's actually how people are defining runaway AI. So when I go there, I go, well, if an AI is a system like Facebook or Google that we're inside of, well, here's another one, our financial markets, right? That's the Equinix NY4 data center where trillions of dollars change hands. It's a little big data center too. Again, our financial markets, this huge collective intelligence application combining humans and people in this complex dance. And guess what? What is its objective function? You know, Milton Friedman in 1970 set this, and then Michael Jensen uh, at Harvard Business School basically <laughs> said, the job of businesses is to increase their profits. Humans are a cost to be eliminated. Sounds like Terminator to me. You know, we didn't mean to increase inequality and gut the economy and, you know, basically get back to that graph that I showed you, but that's what we did. And just as we expect Facebook to fix their algorithms for fake news, I feel like we need to hold our politicians accountable for saying, why are you basically setting up the rules of our economy and the incentives of our economy, the tax structures, to favor the rogue AI that says, you know, optimize for corporate profit, 
treat people as a cost to be eliminated. And that, I think, is a fundamental change that we need to think in our society if we're going to get to this next stage. Because I do believe that we could get to an economy of abundance. I do think that, that when John Maynard Keynes wrote that the true you know, uh, problem for humanity is to, to, to use its, the leisure that, I think it's the leisure that, uh, I can't quite remember the quote, that compound interest and ingenuity will have, have brought to him, uh, you know, to live wisely and well. You know, that is our opportunity. You know? And instead, you know, we're basically making a small number of people incredibly rich and we're gutting the ordinary economy. And I think we actually have to actually debug the algorithms that are at the heart of our modern economy, not just the algorithms that are at the heart of Facebook and Google. And that's a really interesting lesson that I learned very early in my career from a guy named Andrew Singer, unfortunately no longer with us. But he was uh, uh, an early Macintosh programmer, and, and uh, he hired me to write the manual for Think C, which was the first uh, C compiler for the Macintosh. And he, he told me, he said, the art of debugging is figuring out what you really told your program to do rather than what you thought you told it to do. And that's what Facebook is trying to do right now with fake news. And I think it's what we need to do uh, with the systems that guide our economy. Because it isn't technology that wants to eliminate jobs. You know, coming back to the beginning of this talk, uh, Nick Hanauer, who was Amazon's first non-family investor, summarized it so well. He said, prosperity in human societies is best understood as the accumulation of solutions to human problems. We won't run out of work until we run out of problems. I mean, are we done yet? I mean, just look around. Actually, there's this great quote from Larry Summers that I like, too. He apparently once refuted the efficient market hypothesis by saying, there are idiots. Look around. You know, and I have the same point. You know, it's like, you're telling me there's no work left to do? Look around, look around. And, and that's obviously such a message that I think you're all uh, aligned with here at, at this business school. You know, you're saying, you know, let's invest in people. Let's solve hard problems. Let's make the world better. That's what technology is for. And that's what we have to hold it accountable to and what we have to hold our society accountable to. There is an opportunity to make the world better for everyone. So I want you know, to imagine humans treat as assets, not liabilities. You know, an economy based on caring and creativity. Let the machines do all the repetitive tasks. You know, I believe that human creativity will continue to find ways to share, to entertain, and care for each other. And we could make you know, an economy out of that alone. You know, imagine you know, health workers augmented with telemedicine and AI, knowledge when we need it, you know, knowledge built into the tools we use. You know? And of course, we need fresh approaches to public policy you know, based on what technology lets us do now, you know, rather than picking from the same old tired menus of things, well, we tried this 30 years ago, we tried this one 40 years ago. You know, let's go back to this golden age of the past. No, let's reinvent, you know, as Ezra Pound once said, make it new. Let's make it new based on what we can do today. So thank you. So that's why I say, what's the future? It's up to us. So do we want to do Q&A, or, uh, or do we want to just go? Um, or do we want to just go do? I think we have time for Q&A. Yeah, OK, great. Well, uh, there's a mic here if anybody wants. Uh, <laughs> Somebody, we'll, whoever Tiffany is, will come. Uh, but if anybody wants this, I'll run it to you in the meantime. Are you going to do it? OK. Thank you for uh, the wonderful presentation. Uh, one of the aspects and one of the changes that you've mentioned was education. What is your opinion on how deeply we should go reforming the education? Shall we reform like university layer or shall we go to high school? Or maybe we want to go even to kindergarten and really reform it very deeply? Uh, I, I think all of them. Uh, you know, I, I think that the, the, the fundamental thing, uh, actually there's another great quote from Hal Varian that I use in the book. And uh, he, he said something that at first sounds like a heartless libertarian comment. And it's, if you want to understand the future, just look at what rich people do today. And uh, you, know, you think, well, what does he mean? I go, well, you know, rich people used to go on the grand tour of Europe. You know, now people follow their soccer team around Europe, you know, ordinary people. Uh, you know, rich people used to be the only ones with cell phones. Now everybody has cell phones. Rich people were the only ones with running water. Everybody has running water. You know, you look back. 
it's actually pretty reasonable. And I go, well, what do rich people have today? You know, they basically send their, their uh, kids to school with, uh, you know, very small class size, you know, and, and, and very good teachers. Uh, they actually often have tutors for their children. Uh, they have concierge medicine. You know, so actually here's this great message, like if we can democratize that, if we can use technology to make that better, can we give everybody that? But there's also this thing that I guess I've seen throughout my career, you know, which is learning by doing. You know, you know, here at Oxford you work on projects, you know, in, in any kind of, you know, it's not just this sort of receptacle, you know, where you have knowledge pumped into you. And I, do, I think that, you know, the maker movement signals that to us, everything about co learning to code, you know, it's like, you know, giving people projects, uh, you know, I think is, is so much better. And I think we could be taking that from the earliest you know, school. If in fact you didn't have the factory model of school, where you're you know producing a you know standardized mass product, but you did have actually, uh, you know, uh, the education that rich people get today, you know, and you had that for everybody, that would be a really good start. But I don't think it would be enough because I do think that we all have to keep learning, and those of us uh, who are in you know a university setting often have that opportunity to continue to, to learn throughout our life. And obviously there are people in every walk of life who take that opportunity. But I think we need everybody to do it. And I think we also need, um, you know, one of the really interesting things when I think a little bit about the history of, of uh, kind of the, the labor, uh, as labor saving devices come on stream, one of the ways that we've soaked up the labor has actually been sending people to school. You know, so we took kids out of the workforce, then we took high school kids out of the workforce, then we took college kids out of the workforce, and now we have a lot of people who go, well, I can't get a job, so I'm gonna go to graduate school, <laughs> right, you know? And, and you go, well, what if we just said, okay, everybody gets 20% time like they do at Google, right? And you get it for education, and that's part of your job. All of a sudden, we've just taken away 20% of the working hours you know, and, and, and it becomes part of employment, and, and your expectation is that you're learning new things. Now, I think that'd be a pretty cool benefit for companies to offer, uh, you know, and, and it would be a way of them to actually take some of those corporate profits, which are at all-time highs, and say, we're gonna reinvest them in our workforce. And maybe it would mean, hey, we, we basically, you know, and we're not gonna say, well, yeah, you're gonna get that 20% time by, you know, somehow working it out of your own hours. We're really gonna expect you to work less and we may have to hire some more people. You know, it seems unthinkable, but it only seems unthinkable because we accept this crazy idea that the objective function of our companies is to make as much money as possible. I don't run my company that way. You know, and why have we set up an economic system where we actually punish companies, where we punish CEOs if they don't make as much money as possible for their investors? You know, that's like the divine right of kings, except it's the divine right of capital. And I think we could actually say, no, actually, we have this enormous new productivity that we could be using to build a different world. <coughs> Sorry about that. Nothing worse than coughing with a microphone. <coughs> Well, actually, there's a lot of things worse than coughing with a microphone, <laughs> sorry. Wow. <coughs> All right, I'm going to go to level two. Ricola. Um, you talked about uh, the, the usual path of companies from being generous through to extractive as they right. grow larger and how you know, you, you've mm -hmm. worked to actively counter that in your right. own. Uh, and you look at Google, you know, it started off with a kind of don't be evil mm -hmm. uh, mentality and you could argue has become quite extractive. <coughs> Do, is it inevitable that really large conglomerates become extractive? No. I think it's, it's part of the logic of our financial system. <laughs> Let me give you a good example. They're hiding in plain sight. Um, REI. You guys know about REI? The recreational... Equipment International, it's one of the um, original pioneers of outdoor clothing. And I think, I, it may be that uh, there are others, uh, but they're a cooperative. And it's interesting, if you compare them, they're you know, about two billion in revenue. Uh, you compare them to you know, Columbia Sportswear or North Face or these other companies that are their competitors. Uh, they uh, outperform them. Their same store sales are better, their growth is better. All these sort of real economy metrics, but they're kind of invisible. 
because they're not a public company. They don't make any money for shareholders. They actually don't ha you know, have big profits. They give it back to their, you know, to their customers in the form of a rebate. You know, this is this other economic model hiding in plain sight. You know, and, and of course, there are many other cooperatives around the world. You know, the cooperative here in the UK, Mondragon in Spain, you know, big areas of, of Italy where there are many, many you know, agricultural and dairy cooperatives, big dairy cooperatives in the US. But we don't talk about it because we basically built this financialized economy and we basically have regular, or regulatory capture of our governments by financial interests. So I think we actually, it's not inevitable, it's be, and actually there's some actual mechanisms because, and you actually, I have a chapter in my book uh, called Super Money, which is about why even companies like Google, where the founders have control, uh, are ultimately prisoner of the system. And it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, a huge amount of how they pay their employees is with uh, stock options, which they get to basically manufacture out of thin air. Those options are only valuable if the stock keeps going up. All right, so Google basically pays four, you know, creates $4 billion a year of employee stock options, right, which you know, they want to see double, triple, quadruple, and that's why they, how they can attract the best people. If their stock doesn't keep going up, they can't keep hiring. You know, Microsoft faced this as their stock stagnated. And that's part of, you know, one of the dynamics that causes companies to lose. So there's this incentive built into that structure where you have to keep growing. You have to keep becoming more dominant. And so it's a fundamental design flaw of the system. And it's crazy because obviously if Google were a private company and they basically distributed more of the profits, uh, they probably could actually make people very wealthy anyway. There are companies that operate like that. Um, so I just think that the, uh, there's a model that has come to be the dominant model. And I think, you know, again, uh, <coughs> I, I think this is a, a, it's actually, a, you know, it is the last 30, 40 years that that model has become so dominant. If you had talked to a businessman or woman you know, there were a few of them in, in those days and not as many as we need today. I will say I'm so delighted my company is run day to day by a fabulous businesswoman, uh, or President Laura Baldwin, who's doing a far better job of it than I ever did. Uh, and, uh, but I, I uh, you know, they wouldn't say, yeah, that the right thing to do is to gut our community and to get rid of our employees. And, we, can, and, and you know, the, we did actually kind of need a little shaking out because we got into a system you know, starting in the 70s where there was this incredible inflation. Uh, some of you are old enough to remember that. And it was basically wages kept going up, prices kept going up. And, and that clearly needed to be um, you know, reined in. But that's actually just debugging the system. We had a, a, a system that was actually aimed actually after World War II at full employment rather than at shareholder value. And the shareholder value movement was in some ways a correction to that. Oh, I saw an argument recently, Milton Friedman's original 1970 article on the shareholder value idea, the only obligation of companies to make money for shareholders, was actually, if you look at the context, was an op-ed in response to Ralph Nader pressuring GM uh, to focus on fuel efficiency and safety in their cars. <laughs> And, and it was like, no, that's actually, so it's really was actually, and those actually, that pressure from customers would actually have, you know, gotten Detroit on the right path. And so it was actually a really bad design choice in our economy. Thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, Elon Musk and Nick Bostrom have uh, talked fairly extensively about how the development of AI may end up with, with basically all of our cognitive labor being replaced on the basis of price and capability. And you've called for us to avoid that by treating humans more as assets and liabilities. Um, what are your views on what we would do if we take it to be true that we'll be replaced by AI? How would society then, then look in your view? Well. First off, um, I, I guess I want to understand uh, what 
the good life consists of. You know, I, I think sometimes I'm sitting here doing my quote cognitive labor and using the proceeds of that cognitive labor, you know, to pay a gardener to work outside in my yard. And they go, wait, I like working in my yard. I'd much rather be out there, you know, digging up uh, the garden beds than hiring somebody to do it with the fruits of my cognitive labor. Is that so terrible? You know, I mean, there's a lot of ways to work. Uh, and, and to make a good life. You know, I think as, as, as particularly as I get older and I'm, you know, I kind of not as active in my business and not as driven, I go, wow, I can, you know, cook for my family. That's work. You know, I enjoy it. You know, this idea that the, you know, the, the only kinds of work, you know, there's this huge caring economy that's actually the most human of economies that we could, in fact, never run out of. But there's also the creative economy. You know, one of the principles I talk about in my book is something that Clay Christensen uh, talked about. He called it the law of conservation of attractive profits, which is that when one thing becomes a commodity, something else becomes valuable. And I came across a, a great illustration of this recently in Alexis Madrigal's Containers podcast, because he talked about the decline of the, long, the job of the longshoreman. And then he said, well, actually, it's sort of being recreated in, back in the hills behind the East Bay. Uh, where these great container loads of coffee come in because coffee is no longer a commodity. It was a commodity, but humans made it special again. They said, wait, this isn't just coffee. This is single origin coffee from this particular grower in Sri Lanka. This is single origin coffee from this particular grower in Colombia. And those container loads come in, and guess what? They're also going, this isn't just this, from this grower, it's also roasted by this particular roaster. And all of a sudden, coffee is incredible. You know, we charge more for it. We create this wealth for each other, entertaining each other, and creating you know, joy for each other. And that's actually a pretty interesting economy. And you know, I don't see that being replaced by machines. You know, I mean, if that were the case, you know, we'd go, well, we'll go to the burger flipping you know, machine McDonald's. And we'll never go to, you know, Cordon Bleu. You know, why would we do that? You know, when we could have the, you know, no, it's just stupid. You know, the whole essence of, of uh, you know, the, when machines do things, we add creativity to it, and we make it valuable to each other again. If we can afford it. And the critical question to me in the economy is not that there won't be work. It's the question of do we circulate the proceeds of work efficiently. There's, there's, there's plenty to go around. It's just not going around. But how do we continue to own the AI when it is essentially self-aware and self-organizing? Sort of well, I, I, do, I like Andrew Ng's comment on that. He said, I just I find it hard to worry about that. And the same thing, you know, this, this obviously there are some camps. I know the guys at DeepMind are, are worried about this like Elon is. But most of the AI practitioners I know go, we're so far from that. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, you know it, it's this hypothetical. Uh, Andrew Ng compared it to worrying about overpopulation on Mars. You know, it's like, why is you know, Elon worried about rogue AI? I mean, now I do have my own rogue AI worry, but I think it's right here and now. But his far-off rogue AI of the self-aware, you know, hostile AI, I, you know, it's like, Andrew says, it's like overpopulation on Mars. You know, it's like we're not even, we're nowhere near the place where that's a problem. And, you know, some great people, uh, you know, um, um, Joanna Bryson at the University of Bath uh, has a talk where she kind of goes through fake AI fears and real AI fears. And, of course, Zainab Tufekci, uh, University of uh, North Carolina, Amazing, you know, statement. You know, I'm not afraid of AI as if some independent actor. I'm afraid of what power will do with AI. Already, you know, if you want to be afraid of AI, the real AI fears are, oh my God, repressive regimes are using, you know, face detection uh, to pick people out of crowds and then arrest them and torture them and kill them. You know, that's actually that's a real AI fear. You know, as opposed to, well, there'll be a self-aware thing 100 years in the future that might wipe us all out. Hello. Yeah, hi. Next? Mm -hmm. Hi. 
thank you for the, such an interesting talk. So you, in one of your slides, you have shared a quote by Milton Friedman in, from 1970 uh, that the only social responsibility of businesses is to increase profits. And you have discussed in one of the questions that um, uh, maximizing shareholder value, and you have also provided some context uh, for that quote. So I just want to ask you, in today's times, that was from 1970, in today's time when businesses inc are increasingly held to higher responsibility standards when it comes to their their impact on environments and their impact on uh, various other uh, aspects and societal partnership or uh, even how they, how they um, are dealing with customer privacy standards. Uh, case in point, Apple versus FBI case, mm -hmm. when, when Apple was fighting for uh, customer right. privacy. So how does it relate to today's times now? So the only response, the I quote think, of- I think, it's Friedman, yeah. I think it was a terrible idea uh, from the beginning, and it's even more terrible now. It's just that now we can really see it. I can, give, I can grant them that it was kind of well-intentioned at the time, but it's clearly having these terrible impacts on our economy. I, I, I guess I, I think that, you know, we, you know, we need to think through, you know, are our systems working? You know, that's that, that you know, quote about debugging. You know, do the, you know, the art of debugging is figuring out, uh, you know, what you actually told your program to do instead of what you thought you told it to do. We, do, we face that in our society as well. You know, when we see the implications, you know, is, you know, and, and I guess the implications don't always fit into neat categories. You know, like I'm not a privacy fundamentalist. You know, I, I, like, I don't mind that Google knows where I am at all times because they generally use that for my benefit. I do worry a little bit about could, you know, I, I go, what I do want is I want Google not to make sure, to make sure that they don't give that up to a hostile, you know, state. And then the question is, how might we prevent that? But that would be kind of debugging you know, the system. But I feel like the rule of law is, is fundamental. You know, you, know, if we, you know, if we basically are in a regime that, that abuses power, that's a, the problem. You know, and I think rather than saying, well, we're going to somehow make a technology that can't be abused, it's a very, very hard problem. And it almost always uh, you know, we almost always fail at it. You know, what we can succeed at is establishing social norms about what's okay. You know, and, and I've always loved the, the, the passage from Lao Tzu, the Chinese sage, you know, the author of the Tao Te Ching, who basically said, you know, losing the way of life, men rely on goodness. Losing goodness, they rely on laws. And, you know, I kind of go, well, we can walk back up that, you know, and I go, well, you know, let's try to be good to each other and understand, you know, like when Google is using that for my benefit, you know, I, I feel good about that. I'm fine with that. They can have my data, sure. You know, uh, healthcare privacy, you know, here's a terrible example. In the US, we have this law called HIPAA, you know, Health Insurance Privacy and Portability Act or something like that. And basically, if you have a life threatening disease, you're like, take my data. You know, it's like, you know, and the people like, you know, patients like me, uh, that are, you know, people are sharing their data because they want anybody who can help them, uh, you know, and, and yet we have this law that says it's illegal to share this data. They come, no, it's the intent. You know, the reason why we have health privacy is because insurance companies discriminate against people. You know, freaking eliminate that consequence. You know, eliminate that user hostile behavior, and then you go, oh, you know, people don't care. They, they want to share their data. And so I think, you know, again, debugging the system and understanding what we're really trying to achieve. And I go, if, if, if we're really trying to achieve, um, you know, that repressive regimes won't misuse this technology, I go, well, let's try to figure out not to have repressive regimes. Of course, we're fighting that fight right now in the US. Uh, yeah. so. Okay, Tim, I think we better end it there. I saw half dozen to a dozen other hands, and so that's the sign of a provocative and excellent uh -huh. talk and, and book. And so thanks yeah. for provoking us. We do have a drinks reception if you want to sort of follow the herd uh, across, the, uh, uh, across the way here in seminar room A. So there'll be a drinks reception, yeah. and there's also some books available for purchase. But please, uh, again. Uh, uh, can I say something about the books for sale? Uh, Laura Brook, who's from uh, Penguin Random House, uh, has, has actually uh, shipped them here. It's going to be selling them close to Amazon's price. Uh, unlike a lot of the talks I've given where the, the, the local booksellers are kind of like, 
well, we'll sell them for full price because that's what we have to do uh, to, to stay afloat. But even then, I'd like to tell a story about a piece I wrote back in 2002, uh, which was called Buy Where You Shop. And the idea is that you, know, you buy, uh, if you go into a bookstore and you look around and you go, oh, that looks really interesting, and then you go, ah, oh, I'll buy it at Amazon, it's cheaper. You know, you're actually taking the service of looking at the book from the, the bookseller and not paying for it. And you know, on the other hand, if you shopped at Amazon, you discovered it at Amazon, buy it there. But don't just do that price arbitrage. So anyway, the point is if you like the book uh, and you'd like to, 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 to uh, uh, have it, buy it from Laura. She's actually uh, making it easier by matching pretty much uh, close to Amazon's price. So, um, and not only that, you'll get a signature. And as Seth Godin says, a book is a souvenir. <laughs> Thank you.